Welcome to the second annual Woj and Low Free Agency Special Woj's podcast. This is coming to ESPN starting July 1st. And we are, what are we, five days from the most anticipated NBA silly season in a long time. All the big names, or so many of the big names, are free agents. And right off the bat, Woj, we have some breaking news about what Houston Rockets plans are right after Daryl Morey at the awards show, <laughs> the much anticipated awards show last night, said for sure. Houston is going to be the second best team in the West next year. How is that going to be the case? Well, that's the great thing about how Daryl Morey approaches free agency. He doesn't have to have any cap space to be going after a max level star. That's what he's trying to do with Jimmy Butler. When free agency starts on Sunday, Morey's plan is to convince Jimmy Butler to work, try to get Philadelphia to work a sign and trade with the Rockets. You know, essentially tell Philly, I will go sign somewhere that does have cap space. You'll lose me for nothing if you don't work a sign and trade with Philly, with with Houston, to get me there. And then he would partner up Jimmy Butler with uh, Chris Paul, with James Harden. As we remember, he offered four first-round picks to Minnesota before he was traded there. He believes in star power. And to do that deal, hypothetically, it would have to be... Two of these three players would have to be included in it. Clint Capella, Eric Gordon, and P.J. Tucker. Good players. Very good players. And if, you know, Philly didn't want to take on salary, if they said, okay, if Jimmy's going to leave, we would let him leave, they could, you know, they could forward those players on to another team. They could create a trade exception, keep some cap flexibility. But we do know that this weekend, Philadelphia, listen, they're determined to re-sign Jimmy Butler. Now, is it at a four-year max? Is it a five-year max? Will it be something just south of that? They're not interested in just letting him walk. I would love to see Daryl Morey, like, 48 hours before free agency, the whiteboard, the beard, like, unkempt beard, some food stains on his shirt. I mean, he's going all in on a very complex um, scenario. But also, people are going to laugh at him, but two years ago, he told me, on the record in June, <clears throat> we have something up our sleeves. And everyone said, oh, Daryl Morey's got something up our sleeves. You know what he had? Chris Paul. And Daryl has always been about star talent. And you can, you can question whether kind of gutting the roster to add a third ball-dominant star is the right move, and, and that's a fair question. One of the things it is, though, is a hedge against, you know, if Chris Paul's decline right. gets more precipitous, you know, that's like one star kind of goes into a different role. Jimmy would be um, kind of a substitute for that. One thing also to make clear is I've been told it's very unlikely – that Jimmy does what Chris Paul did, which is opt in right. for his salary next year at a much lower number than he can get in free agency to facilitate a trade. Now, all of this is happening because there's suddenly a Western Conference arms race in the wake of one of the greatest teams ever assembled, suffering two incredibly traumatic injuries in back-to-back finals games, two outgoing free agents who maybe will come back, maybe won't, and even if they do, may not play all of next year, and that's opened up everything. And Durant's injury, Kevin Durant's injury... Right. A, a very an NBA tragedy, really. What happened to him um, has has thrown a cloud of mystery over his free agency, which in turn throws a cloud of mystery over the NBA's free agency because he is maybe domino number one. Um, what what have, what have you heard about the injury possibly giving Golden State maybe an in that they didn't have before? Well, it's changed the narrative for Kevin Durant in Golden State. It goes from a player who didn't get credit for. Jumping on board of a 72-win team, the, the, the narrative that he wasn't uh, crucial to winning there, well, you saw that he was. And now, this becomes something that's never been there, an underdog story, a comeback story. Because by the time Kevin Durant would play again in the NBA, two teams would have won championships that aren't the Warriors. And so, in two years, when he's coming back from an injury, when Clay Thompson, let's say Clay stays, and perhaps he's back... Uh, at full strength with the ACL injury, maybe Clay comes back some point next year. Now they're a team people are rooting for, and now Kevin Durant is the builder in Golden State. He's not the guy who just jumped on. And the adulation that I think maybe wasn't there for him in Golden State, it's going to be there. He has he is a beloved figure there for what he came back and did. The the injury that he sustained when he took great risk to play for that team. He's not going on the road anywhere in the NBA again like he did in Oklahoma City where they're holding up cupcake signs and cupcake t-shirts. Even in Oklahoma City. No one's ever calling Kevin Durant a cupcake again. That does change the narrative and the story for KD and Golden State. Now, is that enough to get him to stay there? We don't know that yet. But they have a better case to make 
post-injury than they did pre-injury. Well, let, let's get to the, to the case. Um, number one, I, I think they will feel that they owe him the five-year max even after the injury. Now, that was a no-brainer. He's Kevin Durant. You offer him a five-year max. After an Achilles tear, everything's a little bit up in the air. But after what happened and and the circumstances around it, I think they're going to say we, we just owe it to him. The question I have for you is, and the question everyone around the league has is, has there been a breakdown in trust given what happened with the doctors recommending that he play or giving the okay to play and then the traumatic injury and, and then the, the noise of, well, the doctor said it couldn't possibly get worse and then it gets worse. Has there been a breakdown in trust? Because that would be, he can't go back if there is a breakdown in trust. If there were a breakdown in trust, you would imagine that Kevin Durant's camp and the Warriors would not be in communication. And they have been in communication. They have That's talked. And so um, I, their ability to be able to talk through whatever potential issues there are in trying to go forward, I think those lines of communication are open. Again, does it happen? Does he stay? I think that conversation has yet to really happen between Durant and Rich Kleiman, his business manager, Bob Myers, a new organization. I do think there's going to be a point here where they do talk before free agency starts. But there's no indication that they have been shunned by KD. That, that, I don't believe that's the case. Let's hit Clay because we can't forget about Clay. Um, the, the noise all year has been he's going to wait for that max offer from them. I, I, from what I'm told, that max offer has, it hasn't been commit, communicated to him that it's for sure coming, right? Right. And they... You could offer your own free agent uh, a deal at any point here. That five-year, $190 million max offer before the injury, post-injury, if it's not there for Clay Thompson Sunday at 6.01 p.m. Eastern, the Warriors could then expect him to go out and take a meeting, meetings. But the one team that I think that, that my information is that he would be very open to going to sit down with are the Clippers. And if Kawhi Leonard, if they have a chance to be able to sell Kawhi Leonard on a partnership with Clay Thompson, um, you know certainly that's an appealing that's an appealing sell for any free agent and, and vice versa. Now to be clear, just because they haven't communicated that the five one ninety max is coming doesn't mean it's not coming. In fact, I would right. be shocked given what it, he has meant to their organization. Right. If it didn't come, how do you recruit players in the future if you don't make those offers to KD and Clay Thompson when they played hurt for you? I think it makes as an organization, it makes it tough to go forward and, th- and recruit players in the future. I think they're coming, and there's a name we haven't brought up that's been connected with Kevin Durant for a long time, and that's Kyrie Irving. And that's what we will talk to when we will come back and talk Eastern Conference basketball, maybe. All right. All right, welcome back to the Silly Season special. The NBA Silly Season is here. Um, we talked a lot about Kevin Durant. We did not talk at all in the first segment about the much-rumored superstar to be going with him, and that's Kyrie Irving. And in, in kind of an unexpected twist over the last month, all the noise has been about Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Nets, fresh off a sort of a fun playoff appearance, a, a spirited season and all that, maybe getting one, maybe getting both. Again, Katie's injury kind of clouds that. Woj, what is like? What do we actually know is going on with Brooklyn and Katie and Kyrie? Well, with, with Kyrie, the, the reason he has started, he has gravitated over time toward Brooklyn, is the infrastructure that's in place there. You look at the role players they have. You know, if Kyrie Irving misses ten games in a season or twelve or fifteen, you know Spencer Dinwiddie comes in and starts, and they're not going to lose all those games. And you look at the roster in New York. You know, listen, they would try to bring in some veteran, some veterans if they signed him in KD. But there's an infrastructure there. Karis LeVert and Jared Allen and Joe Harris, uh, players who have shown they could get a team into the playoffs, uh, management, coach there. Those things have made it more attractive. And it's to the point now where I think the Knicks have had to start looking at other contingencies to try to sell Kevin Durant and coming to them. Does that mean... Uh, a Kemba Walker, uh, another free agent to partner with, or just salary cap space this year. Um, he's going to be rehabbing. This is a $38 million redshirt year for Kevin Durant, wherever he signs. And uh, But the, there's no question that New York has felt that thing push away from them and toward Brooklyn. And Brooklyn's in great position here to get a commitment from Kyrie Irving and then use that to pursue KD or or perhaps another free agent. Well, that's the and the point that's been made over and over is like this has always been a two star play by Brooklyn. As soon as they traded Alan Crabb and and his contract and two first round picks, by the way, it took to get rid of him. 
um, it was very clear that they wanted a second star. The question to me is, if, if it's not Durant, what are they going to do? What is their backup plan? If it's, if it's Kyrie, yeah, I'm in the door, I'm ready to go, and Durant says, hey, you know, maybe I don't want to buddy up with you, maybe I want to do my own thing, whatever it is. Where does Brooklyn go from there? Because that, be- or, or do they even want to go to that go that route with Kyrie Irving? Because they have a very good incumbent point guard, D'Angelo Russell, that they gr- helped grow into an All Star, and they have to ask themselves: If not Durant, if he's not coming, okay, do we really want to turn our franchise over to a guy who just detonated Boston's chemistry for an entire year? Right? You no, know, you're right. And the idea of Kyrie as a solo act is not what this plan has been. It has been about getting that second star. It is about KD. And and listen, just like everybody else, Brooklyn would give KD that full four-year max deal. No question. And you, you have to, to even be in this conversation right now with them. And then you hope you get three really good years uh, with him uh, to start off the top. But um, that will be the question about not just do they, will they still take Kyrie Irving without a second star but whether it's Tobias Harris, or Jimmy Butler, let's go down the list of free agents. I'm not. I don't think they want to max any of those players out. Now, m- Tobias Harris, perhaps, but could they get those guys at a lower number, keep some salary cap flexibility? But there's going to be a moment of truth if KD doesn't come and Kyrie says I'm ready to go. Where as an organization, it may not be what you intended, but you say, you know what, we can't. We've got a chance here to improve this team uh, even dramatically, and we'll take on that second star who may not be of all NBA caliber. So, so two things. The one thing I think the Nets will not do, having dug themselves out of the grave, the NBA grave, is to then overpay D'Angelo Russell and splurge on someone like Tobias Harris, who's a very nice player, a very good player. But then you, then I think they risk trapping themselves in, we're a nice team. We may win 50 games one year, we may win 52 one year, but we're just a nice team. Going, shooting for Kyrie and KD at least gives them a chance to be great. And to me, if KD doesn't come, but Kyrie does, and they still, and I, and I do believe if Kyrie's coming alone, I think the Nets will swallow hard and take that risk. I don't know how strongly I believe that. I don't, I think they're divided internally on it, but I think ultimately they'll do it. Jimmy Butler becomes the most interesting other guy to get. Because I think he's a tier above some of the guys you mentioned. He's a really, really good player. And that brings us to Philly. Philly, to me, is the single most interesting team in the offseason. They have Butler. They have Tobias Harris, who they traded a lot mm-hmm. to get. And there's a certain sunk cost element to that. Like, well, we got to keep him. We trade all this stuff. And everyone forgets about J.J. Redick. And the noise about Philly is absolutely all over the place about what they're going to do, what they might do. It changes every day. There are different players become attached to them. Well, I have my own opinion, but what, what what are you hearing? What is the what what uh, on Butler Harris? Take your pick. What is if you had to pick your most likely Philly scenario? What do you think it is? Well, there, there's two things here. First of all, they've got to want them all back. They have to want to pay all of them, and then those players have to want to all play with each other. Does Tobias Harris want to be the fourth option? Now he could get paid like a like a first or second option. He's going to, I'm sure, look at that. Jimmy Butler, same thing. He's going to have other options. Daryl Morey trying to partner him up in Houston. Uh, and, and, you know, J.J. Redick, we don't talk about J.J. He has played, tremend- he played tremendous basketball there are, for there them There are times where, where, where when yeah. he's not on the floor, he, that, where his shooting feels like this is literally the most important thing going on in their offense is that they have this guy running around. Yeah, and I think, listen, there, there, there are a lot of voices in Philadelphia. Elton Brand is a general manager, and he is in charge but you've got multiple owners. You have other uh, strong voices in the front office and on the business side. And and sometimes this conversation goes round and round there because there isn't an easy answer. Because financially, this will strap this organization to bring back everybody, all of that money. And then Ben Simmons. How does – we saw in the playoffs, you know, Jimmy Butler was the playmaker in the playoffs. And they weren't playing Ben Simmons down the stretch. And Ben Simmons is up for his max extension. And – He's not taking a dollar less than the max. And, and so those things are all playing into what's the cost of this thing moving forward. And that, to me, is the most the most interesting part is how dependent they were on Jimmy to run the offense in the playoffs. And the timing of this is interesting, too, because if Jimmy doesn't take a deal from them right away, do they start to panic and worry? And that brings us to the guy we haven't talked about, Kawhi Leonard. Um, it seems like it's a two-team race. Is that is that fair at this point? Yeah, Toronto, the Clippers, and listen, I think they've kept their eye on the Lakers and what that's going to look like. The Lakers financially 
Can they get to what number are they going to get to in free agency in terms of cap space? Is Anthony Davis going to give up that $4 million trade bonus? Uh, he still has time to do that before July 6th, and that deal goes through. But this has been a Raptors Clippers race, and you give the Raptors, Masai Ujiri, that organization, all the credit in the world, because when they traded for him, he had no intention of ever staying in Toronto, and now it is a serious consideration. Uh, I think he's, I think he has really given them every opportunity to sell him, and two things that have worked in Toronto, they could, they sold him on health, they proved they could keep him healthy, and they sold him on winning, and those are priorities for Kawhi Leonard. He has shown he is all about winning. And and they they couldn't have made a better case. Winning the title right. helps, it turns right. out. Um, the interesting thing to me is if he's going to meet with the Clippers and all indications are that he is, um, and he wants to bring another guy with him there, well, who is that other guy? Is that guy going to wait for Kawhi to commit to the Clippers? And is that guy's team going to wait for all those things to happen, or do they move on? Like, all these dominoes all these dominoes are, are timed correctly. Um, we will talk about some of the, the other free agents that we haven't hit yet. There are so many. 40% of the league <laughs> is in free agency. So next, rapid fire through a bunch all of right. free agents when we come back. All right. Welcome back to the Silly Season Woj Low Special. Let's go rapid fire through some free agents we haven't hit yet, starting with... The Milwaukee Bucks, who had the best record in the league in the regular season. Let's take them all as one super player. Mm -hmm. Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez, Malcolm Brogdon. One for three, two for three, three, three for three. What are we going with the Bucks? Well, maybe two for three. I don't know if there's a player in the league with more leverage than Chris Middleton. They can't replace him. He is an all-star level player who, if you were to let him walk, now you've got Giannis Antetokounmpo coming up a year later going, wait a minute. What happened to my championship roster here? Chris Middleton is in, because of his play, because of the circumstances in Milwaukee, he is in line to walk away with a five-year max contract or right or right there. But Malcolm Brogdon is where it gets more interesting, Zach. Yeah, I think I, I, I think it's going to be either two for three or free, three for three, and the missing one in the two for three is Brogdon. And it's just going to depend on his market. The Bucks are going to have a walkaway number where it's just too high for them. The tax payments gets too high. Now, what I will say to that is, this is when you pay the tax. Right. When you're a championship level team, you just opened a new arena. Everything's going great. This is when you pay the tax. I know it hurts because the super max is coming, but that's part of owning an NBA team. If you think Brogdon and, you, and if you think the difference between Brogdon and what the, you replace him with at the minimum right. it hurts your championship odds, you pay. He, he's a restricted free agent. 20 million plus offer sheet for him. I think it's realistic. We'll see. Yeah. Kemba Walker, Charlotte Hornets. Um, boy, they are in a, between a rock and a hard place. You either pay Kemba a lot of money and lock yourself into a team that isn't very good, or you let him walk and then it's pain time. Zach, if they were going not going to pay him, I think they knew the neighborhood it was going to take to keep him, and that was guaranteeing that fifth year on a deal, then why didn't you trade him at the deadline? That's what I don't understand if they were to just let him walk here. Yeah, I mean, the noise has been all over the place, and, and, and you know, all indications are, I mean, he came out and said he would take a little bit less than the Supermax. I don't think they were ever going to offer him <laughs> It's actually a good, it's a good play. I'm going to, I'm going to take less, uh, less of something that they were never going to offer me anyway. So when you do do it, it looks like you were benevolent, but hey. it was a smart play by Kemba. Uh, he's still going to be a player who potentially is going to get a nearly a $200 million deal in Charlotte, 170, 190. What's the number at? That Michael Jordan comes to. We'll see, and I'm fascinated if that deal does come to pass. How are they getting under the tax? How many picks or assets or stretch provision waivers? What are they doing to get under the tax? Let's yeah. move on. Al Horford opting out of his deal with Boston, mm-hmm. telegraphing to the Celtics he has uh, a place or places he would rather play. What is the latest on Mr. Al? Well, it is a source of great intrigue among front offices oh, all over baby. the league. You're not kidding. Agents who are trying to figure out who really has cap space and whose cap space is phantom because they have Al Horford slotted in there. Al Horford is a smart player. He's got a smart agent, Jason Glushan. They are not walking away from Boston without knowing that there is something significant out there, and that significant deal is probably at four years, perhaps over $100 million. There was a limit where Danny Ainge and Boston wanted to go on Al Horford. They do value him greatly, but... He's 33 years old. The idea of going for four years. Smart, by, 20s, smart play by Boston. It's the right play. Right. And, and, it, and it's going to give Boston some salary cap space and flexibility. If they want to go after a Kemba Walker and Nikola Vucevic, they can do some things here in free agency, too. 
Uh, we'll see. I mean, if, if, if he wants a set in stone deal on June 30th, that would seem to rule out teams for Horford that need to make decisions on three or four different players, which would seem to rule out some of my favorite mystery teams. But that's a, that's for another day. <laughs> the most mysterious big name free agent on the market, DeMarcus Cousins. What are we supposed to do with DeMarcus Cousins? I'd believe almost anything you tell me. And you, you, you said it earlier, Zach. Is it if, if somebody one year, 20 million, mid level exception? Golden State could bring him back. It, you know, um, you know, the, the was a seven percent raise off his salary last year. He, I think he has shown people he can still be a very, very good player in this league. Can he stay healthy? Listen, there's a lot of cap space this summer. Teams are going to strike out on their first option, their second option. And I think one of those teams will be there to be a landing spot for DeMarcus Cousins. It's not going to come on day one or two, I don't think. Yeah, you could tell me, uh, you could tell me any number. Also, free Kevin Love. Let's get Kevin Love out of Cleveland. Next, the Los Angeles Lakers, the team of the year so far. Okay. Let's talk about the Los Angeles Lakers. They have two of the five best players in the world and not much else. Maybe the ability to wiggle into max cap space, maybe not. But please tell me it's true, Woj, that the Lakers dumped D'Angelo Russell to free up cap space that they will ultimately use on D'Angelo Russell. It is a legitimate scenario, uh, Zach. The Lakers now at this point are rooting for Kyrie Irving to go to Brooklyn because then Brooklyn renounces D'Angelo Russell, who's a restricted free agent, he becomes unrestricted, and then the Lakers could sign Russell as their third star in L.A., and they get back a much more mature, polished uh, uh, player who's been an all-star, who's put a team into the postseason. Yeah, they're like parents who sent their kid to boarding school. Yeah, finishing school with Kenny Atkinson and Sean Marks. Uh, They appear to at least have gotten religion about surrounding LeBron with people who can shoot the basketball you didn't think that worked into, into last the summer? basket um, and, and by all accounts if if they don't have max space and if they don't get Russell the names you hear are role player shooter types now they're going to need another ball handler for LeBron but you do hear a lot of um, a lot of shooter types the one thing I'll say about a third star is it makes your team incredibly thin but it is insurance against the doomsday scenario where one of AD and LeBron are injured at, at, at some point because that's what the Pelicans are betting on right, right? Terrence Ross, Darren Collison, players like that in L.A. if they break up that match. We will see what happens in a few days. Thanks for tuning in. Woj Pod, Low Post. Enjoy free agency. Into overtime of the Woj Low free agency special. This makes me nervous that free agency itself is going to go into overtime and take forever. I like the the frenzy. Let's get it out of the way in 72 hours. Everyone's signing everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, We started the, the actual show talking about the arms race in the Western Conference in the wake of the Warriors being just gutted by two devastating injuries. Obviously, Utah kind of kicked that off by acquiring Mike Conley. Let's talk about some teams in the West that we did not get to discuss on the show and what they might do, starting with the Denver Nuggets, who who were a couple of bounces of the ball away from getting into the Western Conference Finals. Incredibly intriguing young core with Nikola Jokic, Gary Harris, Jamal Murray, on and on. Um, they have one big decision with Paul Millsap, and some other things going on. What do we want to talk about with Denver? Well, what, and one name you didn't mention that they are talking about a lot in Denver, Michael Porter Jr., who redshirted last year in Denver. You know, people thought was the best, maybe the number one or two rated high school player coming out, uh, got hurt at Missouri, drops to the end of the lottery in Denver last year. They grab him, they sit him out. But all the reasons that people loved him coming into college They've seen that in Denver. He has been healthy. And now you that kind of big, athletic, strong um, uh, wing to play with Nikola Jokic down the road, like he's like found money there. And, and I think if he and he could be the one that takes this program, takes this organization to a to a championship level. Uh, they, they could win the West this year. Now remember in the playoffs, they ended up starting Tory Craig over Will Barton right. for a little more size and a little more shooting. If they can get that in a younger player with more upside than Tory Craig, that's that's incredibly right. exciting for them. And with Millsap, they need Millsap. They don't really have a ready substitute yeah. for him. Trey Lyles is also a restricted free agent this summer, kind of disappointed last year. And so Millsap, they have a $30 million team option on him. They can try to negotiate a, a longer-term deal at maybe less annual money. And if he's not amenable to that, you know, a realistic possibility, I think, is they just say, okay, we'll exercise the team option and figure it out later. Yeah, I think they feel in Denver, Tim Connolly, Arturis Karnishevis, that, you know, they can manage that $30 million 
on their cap, that it's not going to break them. And so if they can't come up with a deal long term, um, a, a two or three year deal at a lower number, they bring them back this year. Like, as excited as they are about Michael Porter, they know that he's not coming in. Essentially, right. he's a rookie and helping that team win the postseason long term. You know, he's a play for them. Uh, but Millsap, listen, he's a player with a lot of value. I know Greg Popovich has been uh, excited about maybe having him around the Olympic team because he's a player who comes in, you know, who will play a role, who doesn't care about having the ball in his hands, who doesn't need to score, you know, can do a lot of things for you, brings a toughness to him. And uh, Paul Millsap uh, does what you need him to do. Yeah. You need him to score a little bit, and he's got a smaller guy on him, throw him, throw him yeah. the ball on the block. You need him to play make. You need him to play. Paul Millsap is just like a little Swiss Army knife toolkit guy that just. Does I mean, we we keep talking about all these teams in the West, and we, you know we we don't talk about the team that was the one seed last year. And these guys are coming back, and they've got their they've got this team back. They're going to have been through a year of the playoff battles. Um, I, I think this Denver team, listen, there's a reason Tim Connolly did not go home to D.C. Now, maybe they could have made How a better offer. How could you offer. leave Jokic? You can't leave Jokic. He's too fun to watch. You can't leave I, him. I saw, uh, we were at All-Star Weekend, and um, I think it was the day before I had reported that Tim Connolly had a new deal with the Nuggets, and Jokic sees Tim in a restaurant. Um, there's a big table of people, and I happen to be in there, and Jokic comes up to Tim Connolly, gives him a big hug, congratulates him on his extension, thanks him again for bringing him to Denver. They've got a pretty good thing going. You can't leave Jokic. Yeah. Let's talk about the team that beat Denver in the second round of the playoffs and actually led the Golden State Warriors for more minutes than they trailed and somehow got swept in the Western Conference Finals. The Portland Trailblazers. If there is another team that should make a Utah-like, let's-go-for-it move, mm-hmm. it's Portland because they have Lillard and McCollum square in their primes, now, Nurkic, they have to figure out when exactly is he going to come back, what condition is he going to be in, will he be ready for the playoffs. But this is a team, after acquiring Kent Bazemore mm-hmm. yesterday, that I think is primed to they, – they cannot just look at their team and say, we made the Western Conference Finals, we're fine, let's sit on our oils, and, 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 and indicators are not going to do that. They, they are one move away from being really, really good. Yeah, and you know what I think helped them? And, you know, the Bazemore – deal was kind of a play to protect them if they lose Rodney Hood in free agency. They can give him, he can get the mid-level there. His market value could be more than that. Uh, he played really well and increased his value in Portland like a lot of players have done coming through uh, Portland. One then that four-overtime game. Against, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, is there a center out there somewhere that they can pick off here, maybe in the last year of his deal? Is there a center that can can kind of hedge hedge against what when Nurkic is going to come back, how is he physically going to be when he does play again? That's part of it. And what I think is interesting, too, is you, you look at them gathering up assets, getting the Sear Little uh, in the back end of the you, first round. This is a you, real talent. This is a this is a guy everybody thought was going to go only, to the top you, ten. You talk to people around the league, it's almost like Portland had a lottery pick. Yeah. Um, and they, to have him and Anthony Simons, Anthony Simons, they're very high on Yes, him, who they picked last year. Now, you mentioned, can they get a center? And to me, one of the interesting questions about them is they are going to be a team that is talked about with Kevin Love. When Cleveland inevitably, inevitably crosses the Rubicon and realizes there's just no reason we need to have Kevin Love on the mm-hmm. team, he deserves to be on a winner, let's try and make this happen, Portland's name is going to come up. Because if you put a playmaking screen setter who can shoot next to Dame and CJ, that's a problem. Now, the question that a lot of people around the league is have it, is, is Kevin Love now more of a center than a power forward? And if so... Does he fit with Nurkic, or does he not fit with Nurkic, and do we need to find more of a 4-4 than Kevin Love? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would like to see that yeah. a lot. Yeah, Portland's been on that search for that third star, that third impact player. You know, Zach Collins, who another player who, be good. who they loved when they drafted him and, and thought that he was going to be an impact player. They have pieces here now. If you're a team that's looking to move an all-star level player, a veteran player somewhere, we just said it's Simons, Little, Collins, those are players you will easily want to part with in Portland. But now they start to ha- they're starting to have the pieces, and they've developed the pieces to be able to go out and get that third player. And that may not be something they do until maybe December, January. Got time. Next year. No rush. Yeah. No rush. Uh, let's talk about one more team in a context that we haven't talked about them, and that's the Clippers, another Western Conference arms race team. It's all been Kawhi, Kawhi, Kawhi. The follow-up question that has not been asked a lot is, what are they doing if they don't get Kawhi? And I truly don't really have a feel for that, except I don't think they'll tank. 
but I don't know what the middle ground there, the kind of treading water so that when the next Kawhis come up, we're, we're still a prime destination. I don't quite know what that looks like. Do you have a feel for that? Yeah, and I think they they don't have to take on a player to march into a press conference to say, hey, we've salvaged this summer. They're not going to do it that way. That deal with Philadelphia, giving them the first-round picks going forward, that 2021 Miami pick that's gone Miami, Phoenix, Philly. It's, I can't even and now track to the that Clippers thing. and and Landry Shamit, which is like having like a real first round pick because this is one that you know is good. You may not pick a good first round pick. He was a player who probably was under undervalued in the twenty four he went within Philly, and so I think the Clippers are in position to not have to overreact if they miss out this year. They have shown they can bring back their group. They can, Gallinari would be in his last year of his deal. I think that they want to resign Patrick Beverly, um, and they could they can just keep going and you know take another swing at it. But what the Philly trade did, and you you said it was, it gave them the ability the next time there's an Anthony Davis, uh, the next All Star player who wants out and wants to be in a big market, like Clippers raise their hand and say we have the picks, we have some young players. Um, like, l- let's get a deal done. But that's a, that's a that's a zero sum game because you're never the only team playing that game. There's always a few other teams playing the. Well, if so and so becomes available, we got ammunition. And then you know Boston played that game for a long time, and then yeah. the guy they wanted went to the Lakers because the players and their agents have power and agency to make that happen. So that's the interesting. You can't just be about that. And I'm interested to see how the Clippers are about that, but also about being good. In the president, because that's a, that's an interesting needle well, to thread. Well, there's a solution to it. Get Kawhi. Well, that would be that if you get Kawhi. Look, P- I don't think people have realized. Uh, uh, some people have. If you get Kawhi and you get one other good player, the next the, one's easy. The Clippers have a path to being the best team in the NBA next year. Like it's a, it's it's not now they'll not they're not easily the best team. I don't know if they are the best team, but they have a path to being in that conversation for sure. Yeah, I mean, the the second star to me is easy. In LA, once it, you get Kawhi Leonard to commit, the next one, whether that's Al Horford, and if Al Horford isn't committed somewhere else, whether that's Al Horford, Clay Thompson. I mean, if if Clay, if the if the Warriors don't have that five year, one hundred ninety million dollar deal on the table, there's an excellent chance that his agent Greg Lawrence and Clay Thompson will be sitting in a meeting with Steve Ballmer, Lawrence Frank, Doc Rivers, Mike Winger. And talking about a return to L.A. Now, people always thought with Clay Thompson, if he goes back to L.A., it's the Lakers. His dad works on the TV network. Uh, he's in position to, um, you know, kind of play for his childhood team. But it would be the Clippers. I just find it hard to believe the Warriors are going to let that happen. I, uh, I, I, I moving really into moving into the new arena, not knowing. Listen, they've got. One of the most popular, one of the best players in the history of that franchise in the prime of his He's career. Beloved. Clay is universally beloved. As I, I don't much as think. Any player I don't think NBA. Joe Lacob. I don't. I don't know what it would look like on opening night in the new arena for Joe Lacob if he if he did not offer a max deal and Clay walked on him. I agree with you. I think they get to it eventually, especially um, especially if KD were to leave. Well. Uh, that just scratches the surface in the West, which is an absolute bloodbath every year. The West just never gets easy, and, and all these teams are loading up uh, because the Warriors are vulnerable. But, you know, that means if everyone's loading up, that means everyone's loading up. And the fact that you did maybe doesn't mean as much because they did and they did and they did. It's going to be wild, and it's going to start getting wild in about four and a half days or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Woj, thanks for lending your insight, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Zach.